and the world came into existence and then you sent your son and the word became flesh and he healed uh, the sick and gave sight to the blind and so we ask now that as we open up the scriptures and study together that you would uh, uh, speak to us in your son and uh, give us eyes to see and ears to hear and give us life. Uh, we ask that uh, your word would uh, do things beyond uh, anything that uh, I could anticipate and speak into each one of our lives. So we ask these things in the name of your son, uh, by your spirit, amen. So, uh, last time we talked about the resurrection and we ended, I ended on a uh, somewhat provocative sort of claim, uh, and that is that the primary way we can know that Jesus is risen from the dead is right here, right? We hear the risen Lord speak to us in the Bible, and especially when we go and hear the Bible uh, taught in a sermon or preached in a sermon uh, in a church on Sunday morning, okay? Uh, that's somewhat provocative uh, kind of claim. It's especially provocative if you make that claim in a philosophy class as I do. Um, so we are going to now talk about uh, how the Bible, it, how we, what it means to uh, hear the risen Lord speak to us in the Bible or through the Bible. Um, so sometimes people think, okay, sometimes people think um, what you have to do before to get an unbeliever to look in the Bible is, what you have to do is you have to prove that God exists first, right? You prove God exists, and then you think about, did God speak in the Bible? Okay, well, you have to go that way. And there's a certain logic to that. Uh, a philosopher named James Anderson gives a great illustration of how that logic works. He says, imagine you have, uh, imagine there are two parents and they live across the world. They really, really love their son. And so um, they really love their son. They know that what they, they have great advice to impart to their son. They live across, halfway across the world. So what they do is being really wealthy, they install a gold plated telephone so that they can communicate with their son. And Anderson says, okay, imagine that they really love their son. Um, they could, his, their, their son could really use their advice. They go to all this expense to set up this elaborate, expensive communication system. And then they never use it. He says, that makes no sense whatsoever, right? If the parents really love the son, if the parents went to all the trouble to establish a communication system, if the parents could actually, what they say could really help their son, it only makes sense that they would actually use a telephone system, okay? It's the same way here, right? Uh, if you prove that, uh, if you give a great argument that God exists, right? He went to all the trouble to make sure that there's human life and that we can talk, speak, and everything like that, right? Communication system, ability to communicate in place. Clearly, we could use some help from him, right? What he has to tell us could really help us, you know, solve, uh, solve our problems, okay? Uh, it only makes sense that he would speak to us, okay? So that is a definite route you can go. You could say, you could establish that God exists or give good reason, and then you could talk about, hey, look, there's the Bible, okay? <clears throat> but philosophers have pointed out uh, that's not the only way to reason, okay? That's not the only way to reason. So the other day I read this extremely complicated argument, really, really complicated, like advanced sort of symbolic logic and things like that. Like even to make sense of it, I'd have to like refresh my memory on, on Bayes' theorem and things like that. Um, but, you know, about... 17, 18 pages, extremely complex, and yet it all boils down, and the only thing I really understood was the last page or two, and it was because they gave a really great analogy. She said, imagine that we have a communication from aliens, or that we think is from aliens, OK? 
okay? Like the movie Contact or something like that, right? We get a signal and it seems to be from aliens. Imagine a, a, a scientist says, hey, wait, 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 stop, okay? Before we, 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 we look at this communi supposed communication and we're going, before we examine it, we need to prove that there are aliens, right? We're not gonna consider this communication, whether it's from aliens, until we can prove that aliens actually exist, okay? Her, her point is, that's nuts, right? Because what is, what is gonna be one of the chief ways we know that there are aliens? No, communicate. They communicate with us, right? So you can't say, no, 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 no. Let's set that aside until we prove that they first exist, okay? So um, what her basic point is, right? Um, that's just as crazy as saying, look, prove that God exists, then we'll open the Bible, okay? Uh, no, we can actually say to people, no, open the Bible and consider whether this is God speaking to us, okay? Because that is, right, a chief way that we can know that God exists, and it's a chief way that we would know that there actually are aliens, okay? So, um, we can take this a bit further, okay? So, imagine, right, this iPad right here. Billions of people think that they communicate with aliens through this iPad. How could we prove that's the case? And I'm going to stipulate all the physical components of this iPad are just like any other iPad, okay? How could we know people actually do or do not communicate with aliens through this iPad? Billions of people claim they communicate with aliens through this. We have to read what the communications say would be a starting point. Okay. Okay. What claims what? are made by the aliens. Okay. Okay. What else? And if the claims that come are in a form that we understand a communication should take, then it's easier for us to understand that it could be possible that an alien did that. Okay. This is always fun when I do this in my classes because, you know, a bunch of college students <laughs> get every sort of answer. What else? Guys, what else do you guys think? How could we know this is, is or is not, does or does not communicate with aliens try to use it for that <laughs> okay okay so is it wi-fi only or wi-fi wi-fi and cellular <laughs> yeah that's the thing too they always ask me oh we get to see if the signal's coming from you know mars or something like that <laughs> yeah that's what i was thinking what's the address <laughs> check out the browser history and then for you computer nerds that know beyond that <laughs> IP address and all. Are there cookies? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and they, and they always tell me, um, you could FaceTime them. And I always, then that always reminds me of that episode of uh, The Big Bang Theory where uh, Sheldon always goes into this, to the room at the same time of day. And so he, um, simulates or you know puts a fake video of himself being like um eaten by an alien and it freaks them out when they you know try to spy on him but uh yeah so uh well <clears throat> you could you could also attempt to communicate with the alien and see if he responds to you okay okay yeah so i mean basically any answer anybody wants to give, even, you know, the wackiest answer my student gives uh, is as good as any other. Because how much experience do we have with alien communication that we know of? Not much. <laughs> or Outside not, of my workplace, right? it's pretty minimal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. The point that uh, someone made is 
we have no prior experience of communication with aliens. So we have no, we can't say what a communication with aliens must look like, right? We can't come up with um, some idea ahead of time of what it must, it has to look like, okay? In the same way, um, we can't say beforehand what a communication with God has to look like, right? If it doesn't look like this, it can't be from God, okay? We, we have no idea. It's, we're, just, we're just speculating. Right. However, however, though, that doesn't mean we can't test the communication. And uh, Phil hit on it. He gave the right, exactly the right answer. We do have some way we can measure whether a communication is from aliens or whether a communication is from God by reading its own claims, right? We can yeah. test out its own claims, okay? And so um, with that in mind, I am going to give a, um, <clears throat> this is a further basic, uh, taking this analogy further, okay? Suppose a purported alien iPad has a book loaded on it that claims Aliens created us thousands of years ago. One alien came in the form of a human and visited us and was killed by us and then rose three days later, leaving this book slash iPad with, uh, with us to communicate with us. Billions of people uh, believe this book and iPad is of alien origin. Uh, the alien came to earth, died and rose again. Uh, this book has detailed biological info on us and tells us the diet and medic medical procedures to live a very long life. They believe aliens interact with them by highlighting different parts of the book to communicate with them. What I mean by like that, why, by that is, uh, take your Kindle app. Your Kindle app um, has these certain parts that are supposedly like the most highlighted quotes in other people who read the book, okay? So you can imagine this, this alien book uh, on the iPad, basically the highlighting part, the highlighted part, it corresponds with whatever you're going through. Like if you're having trouble with a friend, it highlights this part in the book that is exactly about dealing with, you know, having conflict with your friends. If you're having um, a certain medical ailment, Lo and behold, the part that's highlighted when you read the book is exactly how to deal with that ailment, okay? So the highlighting sort of seems to move around and correspond frequently with exactly what you need, okay? So in this scenario, how would you, how would you test whether this, this iPad does indeed communicate with aliens? In my revised sort of iPad scenario. How could we know that this iPad it enables people to communicate with aliens? Read it. Okay, read it. Yeah, read it and, and what would we expect, uh, might expect based upon the information I've given you, what would we expect? Highlights. Yes, right? If if billions of people testify that, hey, look, it, the highlighted portion always fits with what's going on in my life, you read it yourself and see if that indeed happens, right? Does the highlight seem to correspond to what's going on in your life? Okay, what else? What other ways could we know that this was uh, indeed what it, what it claims to be and people claim it to be? Well, I can't help but notice the diet, you know, for long life part. Try try eating like you're supposed to and seeing if people live longer. Yes, exactly. If, if people start following it, start obeying it, start listening to it and see if indeed it does give, give longer life, okay? And it does heal ailments, okay? What else? What about that first item? This one right there. Try the communication. 
Okay. Yeah, that would be uh, yeah down down at the the bottom one. Yeah. Well, it's part of the top one. Oh. Oh, that's true. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Similar similar documents through history that correlate. Yes. Right. Those elements. There's a historical component. One can go and look at it at history. Yes. So there's historical component. Okay. Um, it has medical procedures. Scientists could take what we know about, uh, you know, biology in the human body and see, does it fit with it? Does it make sense? So, I mean, there's, there's some elements there, but yeah, there's a lot of ways, right? When we have an actual specific claims in front of us, this supposed uh, communication from aliens, we have things that we could check, right? We can't say beforehand what an alien communication has to look like. But when we have uh, something that claims to be communication from aliens before us, we can, we can test it, okay? It's the same way with the Bible, right? We can't say beforehand what a communication with God has to look like. But, right, the Bible makes tons of claims. And so we can then test and, and think about whether that actually happens, which so again, once again, open the book, read, okay? So that, those are some of the claims that we are going to look at, okay? Those are some of the claims we are going to look at. So the Bible, the voice of the risen Lord, okay? So the first one, right, there's, uh, I think there are like five, okay? Or three, four, five, yeah, five. So the first one uh, is, it claims to be the word of God. The Bible claims to be the word of God. Can anybody quote to me 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17? Anyone know their Bible drill or their Awana? I don't even know if that's an Awana verse. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. What is that? As I always tip off Claire, I, I'll say well, the All scriptures, verse. God yeah. inspired yeah. something. Don't ask the rest. Hey, no, but that's actually the part that I wanted anyways. All scriptures, God breathed or is inspired, right? God breathed. Okay, great. Okay. So, um, some of you are like, okay, so the Bible claims to be the word of God. Uh, here. So, some of you are thinking, okay, so the Bible claims to be the word of God. Okay, there we go. Done deal. So, we know the Bible is the word of God. Good or, true, good or bad argument, right? The Bible claims to be the word of God. There you go. So we're done. We don't need to actually talk about it anymore. Yes or no? No. <laughs> There's always somebody that wants to say, who's God? Okay. Okay. Right? Yeah. Okay. A lot of people are going to be like, okay, what's the big deal? Um, so, okay. Um, don't make too much of the claim that uh, the Bible claims to be the word of God but don't make too little of it either, okay? Don't make too much of the claim that the Bible claims to be the word of God, but don't make too little of it either, okay? Um, what I mean by don't make too much of it is, well, yeah, okay, just because the Bible claims to be the word of God, obviously, we can't just take that alone, and obviously, uh, I'm, uh, your atheist friend is not gonna take that by itself either. However, don't make too little of it. Okay, don't make too little of it. So, this is one of Lori's cookbooks. This book does not claim to be God's word. It just claims, right? Its only claim is that you can make good food, okay, from it, okay? Out of the billions and billions of books that have ever been written, only a small handful came to be, claimed to be God's word, right? Yes. So even though we can't just say, okay, it claims to be God's word. End of discussion. We're done. So we don't make too much of it, but we don't make too little of it either, right? Instantly, this one, this one point gets rid of billions of books from our consideration, right? Billions of books claim to do other things than to be God's word, okay? So don't make too much of it. Don't make too little of it, okay? So the first thing is the Bible claims to be God's word, okay? The second thing is, is uh, a verse from uh, John 4:42. It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, 
right? That's the Samaritan woman, uh, or that's the people in her town who say, uh, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe, right? They went and heard Jesus for themselves, okay? And I talked about last time, there's a pattern in the Gospel of John of people testifying about Jesus, right? John the Baptist saying, hey, there, behold, the Lamb of God. And then people going, go and seeing and hearing for themselves. Testimony, and then they encounter Jesus, okay? So, not only do, uh, does this book claim to be the word of God, but billions of people uh, believe that God speaks to them through this book, okay? Uh, <clears throat> so, two possible ways of interpreting uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, where it says, um, you know, such and such people heard uh, Jesus and saw Jesus after he rose from the dead. Um, and then Paul says, and he himself, right? He himself also saw the risen Lord and heard the risen Lord, okay? Um, two ways of interpreting that is, is, hey, look, tons of people saw Jesus after, after he rose from the dead. Look, and his point is basically, you can go and talk to them, okay? But including himself in there, it's also sort of implied, right, that we can still hear the risen, risen Lord. We can still encounter the risen Lord. We can still hear him speak in the same way, right? So go do it yourself, okay? So that is the second thing. That is the second thing, okay? So Bible claims to be the word of God, already narrows down billions of books, and billions of people believe that uh, God speaks to them or the risen, Jesus speaks to them in this book, okay? Um, the third thing, okay, is another quote from the Gospel of John. Uh, he told me all the things that I have done, okay? Now, um, can somebody read uh, John 4, 11 through 18, and then verse 39, okay? Now, as uh, everyone turns there, and uh, as somebody uh, reads this for us, <clears throat> Uh, what do these verses indicate that Jesus or the Bible should, uh, what verses indicate that Jesus or the Bible should diagnose us and show us our ultimate need, okay? In these verses, we'll see that Jesus or the Bible should diagnose us and show us our ultimate need. I want you to tell me which verses uh, in what we read uh, indicate those two things, okay? Can somebody read those for us? or that, those verses. I will. If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give, he will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and, he, and, and come here. The woman said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands and the one whom you are with, the one whom you have now is not your husband. You have spoken truly. 39? Yep, 39. Let me scroll a little A little more. <laughs> and many of the Samaritans of the city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. And he told me all that I had ever did. Okay. So which of those verses indicate that um, the Bible or Jesus diagnoses or has insight into us? I'd say 17, Keith. She already knows the answer that she's going to give. Okay, okay. Yeah, he knows he knows the answer she's going to give. What else? Yeah, he, he's diagnosing her ability to tell a 
tell a lie or tell the truth. Yeah. But he knows she has a spiritual need too by the whole conversation of the water. Okay, yeah. So that's that's the other part, right? Her her need uh, that that the Bible or that Jesus can diagnose our deepest need uh, is yeah in that discussion about the living water, right? The living water, and we'll never thirst again. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, and yeah, he also has insight, right? He seems to know uh, about her entire past, right? Okay. <clears throat> um, it's not husband, right? It's husbands. And the one whom you now have is not your husband, okay? So he has insight into that, okay? So the third thing is, right, the Bible claims, uh, and we would expect that Jesus, through the Bible, through his word, has great insight into us. It diagnoses us. It, um, it, um, it has greater insight than our, the greatest, you know, psychologist, uh, can break basically break us down, or um, even our best friend. Uh, it as Hebrews four says, right? It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart, so that when we read the Bible, it seems to penetrate, peel back all the layers that uh, even our best friends uh, can't do, and even the best psychologists can't do. Okay. The other thing it does is it has insight into the deepest need of human beings. Okay. So uh, Pascal has this quote, okay? He says this, man's greatness and wretchedness are so evident that the true religion must necessarily teach us that there is in man some great principle of greatness and some great principle of wretchedness, okay? What is, what is Pascal saying? True religion must necessarily teach us that there is in man some great principle of greatness and some great principle of wretchedness. What is he saying? I think of the old nature and the new nature when I read this. Okay. Okay. So, but is he talking, when, when you quoted him, is he talking about religion in general? No, he's saying whatever the true religion has to have. Uh, oh, I see. To, okay. Yeah. yeah. Whatever the true religion, he says, the true religion must necessarily teach us that there is in man some great principle of greatness and some great principle of, principle of wretchedness. Because we're created in God's image, and yet we're fallen. Okay. Yeah, yeah. He's saying, right, he's saying you look around at, at people, and whatever the true religion is, right? Whatever the true religion is, has to be able to explain the greatest things you ever see in humanity and the most wretched things you ever see in humanity, right? The lowest yeah. of lows, true religion has to be able to explain that. Yeah. The highest of highs, true religion has to be, ex be able to explain that, right? right? The things that you see in the news that make you just go, I, I, that just sickens me. I can't believe, right? True religion has to be able to explain that. And it has to be able to explain uh, the loftiest things that, uh, that, that we ever see as well. So just today, I was uh, reading a book. Uh, and part of it uh, says, he says this. Um, so in these verses, the preacher simply describes how it feels to keep watching the news report about baby P instead of flicking the channels because you can't bear it. Peter Connolly, referred to as baby P during the trial of his parents, was a 17 month old boy in London who died after suffering over 50 injuries during an eight month period. During that time, he was repeatedly seen by healthcare professionals who failed to notice the harm he was enduring. 
he was left in a home of unspeakable abuse and trauma by people who had the power to rescue him. A paramedic friend of mine was called to assist a man who had fallen at home. In a, fil in a filthy living room with a foul stench, he and his calling dis colleague discovered a 60-year-old man who had been left by his son to lie in the same spot for over two weeks. When they tried to move him, his skin came away from his clothes and body. He had to be wrapped in burn dressings after lying in his own urine for so long. In Birmingham, a toddler named Christiana Logina, Logina died of septic shock after her mother held her under a scalding shower as a form of punishment. She lived with her injuries for two weeks and eventually died because her parents had refused to seek medical help for her wounds, right? I just thought those were a couple sort of Uplifting. examples that just make you say, I can't believe I, I can't believe, I just can't believe that, right? And so Pascal is saying true religion has to explain those stories. It has to explain the Nazi concentration camps. It has to explain, you know, the worst imaginable things you can imagine. And it has to explain the lofty, lofty potential we see in human beings, okay? So <laughs> here's an example of basically of how, uh, the Bible explains basically uh, an example that, that we can see, okay? So there's something called Snapchat dysmorphia, okay? What Snapchat dysmorphia is, <clears throat> is um, plastic surgeons are reporting. They're saying people used to come to us to say, here, you see this photo of this model or this movie star? Can you make me look like them, okay? So they used to bring photos of um, you know movie stars and, and, and people like that. But now people are bringing um, um, filtered images of themselves, right? Um, <clears throat> through Snapchat filters and through all the different filters. They're bringing photos of themselves, but ones that have been modified so that um, the plastic surgeons are saying, <laughs> This is actually physically, biologically, impo physiologically impossible to actually make you look like this, you know, is what they're either thinking or saying, okay? <clears throat> so uh, before, right, at least your goal was to look like somebody who actually exists, even if they themselves had a lot of plastic, plastic surgery. But now they're reporting that they basically want to look like something that is not physi physiologically possible, okay? In other words, they want a sort of otherworldly beauty, a beauty that does not exact it, that does not exist in this world. Okay. Well, Christianity explains that. The Christian faith, the Bible, actually explains Snapchat dysmorphia, right? Because we have this innate sense that we are destined for otherworldly beauty. And that's what the Bible teaches, right? We are destined to be conformed to the image of Christ to his resurrected body, to a glorious physical beauty beyond comprehension, another worldly beauty, right? One that cannot be attained in this world. Hmm. So that's the highest of highs. So Christianity explains that. But at the same time, right? At the same time, how sad is it that humans are trying to look like, right? Basically, this this impossible to look beauty right that they are getting plastic surgery done to try to attain it and they're going through eating disorders and other things like that right so highest of high lowest of lows right the bible explains both of it okay and that's what pascal is saying <clears throat> true religion needs to be able to do okay so that is the uh third thing okay so the fourth thing the fourth thing one thing i do know that though i was blind I, now i see that is john nine twenty five. that is uh the blind man that jesus healed speaking okay so jesus heals a blind man the pharisees come along and you know what jesus did this on the sabbath do you know that he was like totally breaking god's law and the blind man says, I have no idea, right, about, about this or that about Jesus. All I know, right, the one thing I do know uh, is that though I was blind, now I see, okay? And so um, uh, C.S. Lewis says, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, 
not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else, okay? By it, I see everything else. So the fourth thing is, right? Test out the Bible, right? See if it makes sense of everything else in the world. See if it makes it sense of everything else in the world. Another quote, uh, the Bible has repeated structures and patterns which act like a pair of x-ray goggles that we put on to see all the world, all the time, as it really is, okay? So uh, I tell my students, uh, every class at uh, CBU is essentially a test, right? Does the Bible essentially make sense of all your different, all the different subjects that it, to be studied, right? Does it make sense of psychology? Does it make sense of science? Does it make sense of physics? Does it make sense of uh, political science? Does it make sense of philosophy? Does it make sense of art and music and so on and so forth, right? <clears throat> and um, a couple examples that I give is one is uh, what's called elegant math, elegant math, okay? People are surprised to learn that many scientific discoveries occurred because some scientists or mathematicians just fiddled with equations. They just kind of fiddled with the numbers. And they thought, you know, if we do this, and if we add this, and if we do this and make and balance this out and everything like that, that looks really cool. Okay. In other words, they fiddled with the numbers and it looked beautiful to them. It, it looked great. Scientists then tested out those equations and lo and behold, scientists made discoveries. That is completely bizarre, right? That math that just looks beautiful to us, that looks like it, 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 should, it should be that way, actually tells us the way that the world actually is. That's just weird, okay? That's weird if you're an atheist and it's weird um, based upon evolution, evolutionary naturalism, but it makes complete sense uh, from the Bible's perspective, okay? Music, music is another thing, okay? Uh, one one uh, philosopher uh, says this, Christian philosopher, he says, listen to your favorite music and imagine, I only like this because it helped animals survive. If the tides had rolled in differently, I might not like it at all. Okay. He basically makes the point, right? According to evolutionary naturalism, right? Your favorite song is basically a result of tides. <laughs> if they rolled in a different way, you may not like music at all. You may like a different, totally, di totally different song. That is a weird thing to think about, right? But from the Bible's perspective, it makes complete sense, okay? So the Bible uh, makes, puts everything together and helps uh, make sense of so many other things, okay? So then... Uh, <clears throat> The last one we'll look at is one we kind of touched on to end last time. The sheep follow him because they know his voice. John 10, 4, talking about the good shepherd. So um, Mary is at the tomb again, right? And she's all uh, despairing because someone stole the body of Jesus. Someone stole the body of Jesus. And she goes and laments to the gardener. And who is the gardener, really? It's Jesus, okay? But she can't recognize him uh, until, she, until the gardener says, Mary. And then light bulb goes on, and all of a sudden she says, Jesus, okay? And what's the point that John is teaching us? Uh, he's teaching us, right, that the good shepherd calls his sheep by name, and they know his voice. They recognize him, right? When Jesus said, Mary... She recognized the good shepherd. She recognized Jesus, okay? So, uh, the last thing, right? We hear the voice of the risen Lord uh, when he calls us by name. The good shepherd calls us by name in this book, and we recognize his voice. <clears throat> now, some people may 
some uh, people, especially atheists, may be saying, okay, that's kind of subjective, right? To say, when I read this book, it's like, it's like Jesus is calling my name. It's like he knows my name. And, and, and I can just recognize his voice when I read this book. That, that's kind of subjective, okay? Um, well, uh, part of my dissertation uh, involved uh, looking at uh, research into recognizing faces, voices, tastes, okay? Um, so who can recognize the face of their best friend? Who can recognize the face of their best friend? Okay, I assume all of you can recognize the face of your best friend. Okay, uh, so who's willing to describe the face of their best friend? Who will describe the face of their best friend? And I will jot down uh, some of uh, your description in, this, uh, in the chat box so we can all sort of remember it. Who can describe the face of their best friend? Anybody? Well, I know you can all recognize your face of your best friend. So just uh, somebody, somebody describe the face of their best friend. Okay, my uh, best friend has um, brown eyes and um, a, a pretty smile and um, she smiles a lot and And she has a um, infectious laugh and what else? <laughs> and she's getting old just like me. Hmm. Anything else? Um. Okay, that's great. That's actually way better than I could do. Um, <laughs> it, it varies. I, I do this in class and it always varies according to some or the other. Uh, one time, <laughs> one girl was describing and as she was describing and as I was writing on the board, uh, everybody kept saying, oh, oh, the entire class. And I'm like, why are they saying, oh? It's because her best friend's sitting next to her and she's looking at her while she describes her, okay? So, um, that, you know, she had an advantage, okay? Um, yeah. So, how many of you, right, in a, uh, you know, in, say, a, a uh, at a old high school reunion, uh, uh, if you went to an old high school reunion and uh, you knew this, uh, this lady was at it, how many, how many of you could find that, find that best friend based upon her description? Mm. Not many. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you wouldn't be able to, right? Okay. No. Um, and the, and the reality is even, even the, the best descriptions in the world um, cannot actually fully distinguish that person from everybody else in the world so that right. we could be absolutely sure, right? Right. Um, and yet, one of the things that we are very confident about is that we can recognize other people when, you know, when we, when we see them, okay? Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's extremely objective, it's extremely rational, but, and yet, right, we cannot really describe, uh, give a description of it that uh, enables us to do it, okay? We just do it, okay? So it's the same way. Uh, it's the same way with us saying, we hear Jesus speak in this book. We hear the Spirit uh, speak, and we hear Jesus speak. We hear the Good Sheep Shepherd speak to us, okay? Uh, I just went over a several things, right, uh, that um, as I went over them, a lot of you probably thought, oh, yeah, okay, I see that, right? Um, I see uh, it is no longer because what uh, other people have testified that that Jesus speaks in this Bible, but right, okay, I've heard it myself. Uh, we realize that, okay, in this book, right, when we read it, it seems to diagnose who we are, it seems to penetrate into our soul, um, and it seems to explain human beings, right, uh, their potential for greatness and their potential for wretchedness. Uh, we see um, 
that when we read this book, yeah, all of a sudden the whole world makes sense. Everything begins to make sense. Okay, so we see we a lot of a lot of you when I read those and when we went over those and we talked about them, you go, okay, yeah, I, that makes sense. Okay, but a lot of you probably could not have articulated it. Okay, that's just like recognizing faces, right? We recognize faces all the time, and some of us are more aware than others of being able to describe exactly other our best friend's face, but others of us, uh, especially like me, we just do it completely oblivious to uh to how we actually do it and what we're requiring on okay it's the same way it's probably even more so with tastes right uh try to describe the taste of honey <laughs> you won't get much beyond probably sweet okay and other things like that and it's even more with specific taste of the food from particular places and things like that okay and yet it's it's entirely objective okay um so then I have this quote from Paul Helm. Uh, Part of the reason for believing that a person is a king may be that he says he is a king, but the evidence that he is a king is much stronger if he is seen exercising the prerogatives of a king. It is, is, it is the evidence for their being so, but also that they function as the word of God. Okay? So it's one thing for the Bible to claim to be the word of God, claim to be, the word of the king, but it's a different thing when we see the king exercising his power through the Bible. And we have experienced it ourselves, and there are many stories of that. So let me give you uh, one example um, fr um, from the brother-in-law of my pastor, <laughs> who's so, you know, this, this will sound like a story that, um, that is just made up. Like, okay, has that actually happened? Okay, but my pastor actually knows this person, and he's actually there's a Valley Baptist Church. So you could, like, email him or go meet him and ask him about, about this story, okay? Uh, but basically, this is what happened. He absolutely used to hate Christianity, wanted nothing to do with it, okay? But he's on a college campus uh, one day. And he sees them, they're handing out free stuff. And he thinks, oh, free. I want something free. Everybody loves something free. So he goes over and he sees that crowd and he goes over to get the free thing. And who is it? it, it it's people handing out a free Bible. And he's like, oh, man. But he does not want to be rude. So he thinks, okay, I'll take the Bible and I'll just go around the corner there and I will throw the Bible in the trash. So he takes the Bible goes around the corner and he sees his friends. And so he starts talking to his friends, forget about, forgets about the Bible in his pocket. So talks to his friends, goes home. When he's home, he just has, he, he sees the Bible. He realizes he forgot to throw it away. He just has this overwhelming urge to, to read the Bible. So he flips open to a verse and it's a verse about judgment. And he just has this thought, this overwhelming sense, this is truth. And so he's scared. He's thinking, okay, judgment. I'm going to be judged by God because uh, he, he knows he's sinned greatly. So what is, what is, he has no idea what to do. And then he thinks, you know, I once got really disgusted for some guy giving me a, a gospel tract. And I threw that tract behind my dresser. I wonder if that tract is still behind the dresser. So he goes behind the dresser, digs out this gospel tract, and gets saved. Okay, and now he's pastor of you know one of the pastors of of the church with about five thousand attendants, at least when they were assembling together. Okay, and it's somebody you can actually go talk to. Okay, so the power of the word of God, right, to change people's lives. Okay. Uh, another example, also from my pastor, <laughs> he knows of a, an evangelist by the name of Leo Humphrey. Okay, uh, he he, uh, I think El Salvador or Honduras or some country like that. He uh, goes out and preaches in the street, uh, or would preach in the streets. Uh, he's with the Lord right now, um, but he has a story of preaching out on the streets, and there's this there's this super drunk guy like heckling him. Okay, heckling, heckling, heckling him. And he just ignores him, keeps on preaching. OK, 
Okay. Um, and at one point, he, keep, he keeps on preaching. At one point, uh, the guy passes out face down into a puddle. And so he keeps preaching. He picks the guy up out of the puddle, and he just keeps right on preaching. Okay. He, he, he doesn't even really think about it. Uh, years later, he's in a church. And some guy comes up to him and says, hey, do you remember me? You saved my life twice. You pulled me out of that puddle to keep me from drowning in. I'm a believer now because, because of the gospel you're preaching, right? This drunk guy passed out in a puddle, uh, got saved by, 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 by uh, the evangelist, okay? And so, and of course, you know, stories like that could be multiplied and so forth, right? Um, it's one thing for the Bible to claim to be the word of the king. It's another thing if it exercises, the king exercises his power through that book in the same way, okay? And so, uh, the end, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And so, I tell my students, uh, your, entire, your entire time at CBU is essentially an invitation. It's an invitation to see if the Bible diagnoses who we are, uh, it meets our ultimate needs, it enables us to see everything else by it, and we experience the kingly, the kingly voice for ourselves, okay? But, right, but investigating this book is not like investigating any other topic, okay? Uh, it's like basically Jumanji, right? Um, at a certain point, the kids realize it's not just a book. They're actually in it, right? They're living it, okay? And so we investigate, the people investigate this. Um, you know, uh, Pilate asks, uh, what is truth? <laughs> but he was actually asking, what is truth? To truth incarnate, right? Truth, truth walking amongst us. And so we investigate this, uh, this book as to whether it contains truth. And lo and behold, we actually encounter truth incarnate. We encounter Jesus, the word made flesh himself, okay? So it yes. is not like any other research project. It's not like any other book, okay? So uh, we will uh, take a different angle on uh, uh, the Bible as the voice of the risen Lord uh, next week, okay? We will continue on with a totally different uh, angle at it. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you.